All right, First Samuel chapter 4 is where we are. We're ready for verse 10. 1 Samuel 4, verse 10. I was glancing at a book yesterday. I had run to McKay's for to see if they had something, which, you know, McKay's is wonderful. I love McKay's, but don't go there wanting something specifically because I've been looking for two months. Nobody's brought a book in that <laughs> fits what I want. So anyway, uh, that's all right. But um, I was looking at, at a book yesterday that was a survey of the Bible, and I just thought, well, I just want to see, because I wanted to see the author. I wanted to see how he wrote. And and so I flipped over uh, in this survey to the book First Samuel to just see what he said. And he says, this is a time in which he, unifying of the kingdom. And there's a lot of truth in that. We began in First Samuel chapter 1, and we found, uh, we found Samuel. And we found then, as we progressed, go right through. You survived another year. All right. Do what? Oh, you're welcome. Not a problem. But uh, we uh, we looked at, at First Samuel and and we saw Samuel, we saw Eli, we saw uh, that Eli didn't discipline his boys, and consequently, as we saw last week, the ark, the the battle, if you will, the battle at uh, at, at Aphek as verse 1 calls it, and we find out now, <clears throat> especially beginning in verse 10, that as the Philistines fought, Israel was defeated, and every man fled to his tent. There was very great slaughter. There fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. Also, the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas died. Now, all of that, if you think about it, fulfilled what we found in the last part of the second chapter. There was a prophecy, for lack of a better term. There was that which was said would happen because of Eli's lack of discipline, lack of, of teaching, and lack of instruction of his, his sons, that ultimately we see it fulfilled. We see the glory of the house of, of Eli leaving, so to speak. You can imagine that this brings on um, a lot of angst. You're Israelite. Think about it. You're an Israelite. You're Abraham's seed. The Ark of the Covenant has always been there for you from a standpoint of the people. This is where God is. This is the presence of God. Just stop right here. I heard the most ridiculous preacher story that I think I've ever heard uh, Sunday, or Monday, excuse me, this preacher was telling that uh, he was talking about carrying the ark across um, um, the Jordan. And as uh, he was talking about it, this lady raised her hand, and she hadn't been a Christian that long. And she said, you know, that's amazing. How in the world did they ever lift up that ark with all those animals? He said it was real. He said the person was sincere. Um, I think that was the worst thing. I've, but you know, when you're young and you don't know, you don't know. There's a lot of truth in that. And that's kind of really the point he was making. And that is true. I mean, I've run into folks that didn't know. But the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat. We talked about it. The presence of God. And now it's gone. They carried it to battle. The battle wasn't going their way. They carried it to battle. Uh, Hophni and Phinehas did, for the reason being that God would be there with them, and pretty much to them, the ark had become a sort of a good luck charm. You know, if it's there, uh, and we all rub the heads of a redheaded whatever, you know, <laughs> we all have those superstitions, if you will. And they had that idea, well, we'll bring the ark in, God will be there, God will be with us, the battle will turn. But here, in the last two verses of this paragraph, the battle turned, but it turned continually against them, 
wrong way. And the children of Israel lost. And if you really think about what they lost, they lost men, they lost the Ark of Covenant, they lost the two sons of Eli. Well, the, the, then a man of Benjamin, verse 12, came and reported to, to Eli. He ran from the battle line the same day and came to Shiloh with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. Shiloh is, best we can tell, probably about 18 miles away from where he was. That's very doable in a day's time as far as journey, running. And notice that he came with torn clothes and dirt on his head. It's sort of a, a sign of tragedy, if you will. Things didn't go it their way. And now when he came, there was Eli sitting on a seat by the wayside, watching for his heart trembled for the ark of God. Uh, just stop right there and think about that. He's sitting, and, and we don't know where. There, there were really two places that he sat. He sat, first of all, he sat at the gate, and, and there are some times that he sat in further into town, but it seems as if maybe he was at the gate, according to uh, when we see it. Verse 18, we'll, we'll come across it and see that he was sitting, uh, look at verse 18, it says Eli fell off the seat backward by the side of the gate so that he was probably at the city gate uh, watching. And notice that it says he's watching, and the reason he's watching is that his heart is trembling. He has anxiety, fear, if you will, for the ark of God. doesn't say anything about his sons, does it? His fear was for the ark of God. And when the man came to the city, told it, all the city cried out. When Eli heard the noise of the outcry, he said, what does the sound of this tumult mean? And the man came quickly and told Eli. Eli was 98 years old. His eyes were so dim that he could not see. So he's blind. He could not see. Willis, in his commentary, made the statement, not that it really mattered, but it was interesting. He made the statement. He said that if he had seen, if he could see, and he had seen the runner, he would have known what had happened. Eh, maybe a little bit far fetched, but nevertheless, we have we have this this great travesty, if you will, that has occurred, and so all the the Israel is now upset. Then the man said to Eli, "I am he who came from the battle, and I fled today from the battle line." And he said, "What happened, my son?" This is not his son from the standpoint of Hophni and Phinehas because they died. This is not another son. It's believed it's the, the Hebrew term is more of a sense of endearment. You know, here's a 98-year-old man just talking to a younger man, probably realizing that he's younger because notice what he says. He says, I've come from battle. And he says, uh, he says, so what's happened to my son? He's just simply endearing himself to him. And so the messenger answered, and there's four losses really that are, are listed here. The messenger answered and said, Israel has fled from the Philistines. So number one, Israel, if you will, is lost. There's been a great slaughter among the people, a lot of deaths. Well, we, we saw that um, when it said that 30,000 fell. Also, he says, uh, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. And then he says, and the ark of God has been captured. So there's really, in many ways, there's four losses. The loss of Israel, the loss of people, the loss of the ark of the covenant, and then the loss of, of uh, Hophni and Phinehas. And so you have Eli, whose responsibility it is, is to be in charge of the care of the ark. And now it's gone. It's lost. Now, what's going to happen, especially in the fifth chapter, is kind of interesting and fascinating, but let's don't get there too fast. Then it happened when he made mention of the ark of God that Eli fell off his seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died, for the man was old and heavy, and he had judged Israel 40 years. You can imagine. 
I, I've lost the thing that I'm responsible for. It's of God, from God, by God, with God, if you will, in it, so to speak. I've lost it. My care. It reminds us, though, in many ways of the importance of our stewardship. We have been entrusted with so many things, if you think about it. We've been entrusted with this world. We've been entrusted with our soul. We've been entrusted with our physical bodies. We've been entrusted with with everything that we have. And all of those things that God has given us, we've been entrusted with, with the idea of taking care of them. And a lot of times we, we don't think about the taking care of all of these things, but yet the all of these things have been entrusted to us and we're to take care of them. And this story in many ways reminds us of the importance of taking care of what you've been entrusted with. Eli failed. And so, in the sadness of the report, Eli, it says he was heavy, fell backwards, fell off of his stool while he was at the gate, and his neck was broken and he died. This is the only mention of the fact that he judged Israel. But it says that he judged Israel for 40 years. Could he be a judge and priest? The answer is yeah. This is the last of the judges, by the way. And we see really not only that tragedy, but there's another tragedy that follows. Now, his daughter-in-law, Phineas's wife, was with child, due to be delivered. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband was dead, she bowed herself, gave birth, for her labor pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the woman who stood by her said to her, Do not fear, for you have born a son. She did not answer, nor did she regard it. In other words, she didn't pay any attention to it. Then she named the child Ichabod. Ichabod means, hello, there is no glory. The glory, she says, has departed from Israel. Now, the glory here represents really the Ark of God, the, co- the Ark of the Covenant, the, the Ark that uh, is where God was thought to be. And so when it talks about the glory has departed from Israel, it's talking about um, the Ark. Because the Ark of God has been captured and because of her father-in-law and her husband, and she said, the glory has departed from Israel for the Ark of God has been captured. And so you have the tragedy of not only Eli and not only Israel and the ark and Hophni and Phinehas and the the men of Israel, but you also have the the daughter-in-law, Phinehas' wife. And then you have, when you think about it, you also have a, a young man, a baby, if you will, that is born in this world, given a name which all the names of the Old Testament, you know, so many of them had meaning. And here he is stuck the rest of his life with a a name that simply means and reminds everyone, really, when he was born, the glory of God was taken. When he was born, we weren't doing what we were supposed to be doing. When he was born, you see, and he then carries that burden with him all of his life. And so you see the difficulty and you see the sadness of the whole story. Now, there's a reason. This is the history, if you will. This this whole book is history. It's not any of thou shouts and thou shalt nots about it. It's just a, a history, a free-flowing history that reminds us of a lot of things. A couple of good lessons, though, that you might get out of this chapter is, is that God keeps his promises. God made the promise in in the second chapter of this book, God made the promise, you know, it's all going to leave. And I'm sure there were those in the second chapter when that happened that went, that'll never happen. We're the children of God. God won't do that to us. God won't allow that to happen. But he did. Not 
any, oh, excuse me, let me get the correct grammar. None of us, there you go. None of us are so good that God gives us a personal exemption and pass for all the time. None of us. Israel's not in this case. You might say, well, they did wrong, and they did. They, they did what they were not supposed to do, and you're right. And because of that, they suffered. God keeps his promises. He cannot lie. It's not a matter of does not lie. He cannot lie. But then secondly, when we forsake God, there will be a price to pay. That price is not always immediate. That price is not always when it occurs. Sometimes it's yet to be. In the book of Second Peter, Peter reminds us that there were those that were living immoral. And the reason they were living immorally was because everything continued as it had from the beginning. In other words, they didn't really believe that the Lord was coming. Everything it just keeps going. You know, you just each day you you wake up, you work, you do the things you have to do, the things you want to do, the things that are necessary. You go to bed, you get up the next morning. Same thing over and over and over and over and over. There's nothing different. And so those in Second Peter's day, that book's day, they simply said, you know, he's not coming. We can do what we want to do. Well, Israel kind of had that attitude too. God's people do what we want to. And God reminds them, no, you can't. That there are consequences to pay when you forsake me and when you go against my will. And so this is a great lesson to learn for all of us, that we're not above anything or anyone. Anything anybody like to say about the fourth chapter? Well, the story continues. And as as it continues, we we see kind of I think I find humor in this chapter and in the next one. It's sad, yes, but you, you take the Ark of God, you put it by Dagon, and and lo and behold, he doesn't stand up. And the contrast and, and why is there and how? Let, let's just look at it. It's kind of interesting because really wherever the ark goes, wherever the Philistines carry the ark, great calamity is suffered. Wherever the ark is carried. Think about it. Presence of God. How does how how do the the gods and mention Dagon here? Let's talk a little bit. The Philistines were polytheistic, in other words, they had many gods. I don't know how many, but I just know that there were, were quite a few. Dagon is believed to be the head god, if you will, the main one. And so he being over all things, and they had a representation of him. And the Philistines are going to have a hard time. Where do we put the ark? Where, where do we put it? We've got it. Now what do we do with it? It's it's almost like the dog that chases the car and the car stops. What does the dog usually do? He stops and it looks at the car and thinks, or looks like, what do I do now? And so the Philistines, they have been in battle. They have gotten their trophy, so to speak, in that they've gotten the Ark of Covenant. They have defeated Israel. But now what do we do with this Ark of the Covenant? And one of the things that seemingly is real, or as I look at the fifth chapter, maybe I'm incorrect in this, but as I look at the fifth chapter, seemingly to me, the Philistines recognize, yeah, God's there, and we're not going to overcome him. What are we going to do? Let's get into it. When the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer, to Ashdod, this was about, Ashdod was about 33 miles west of Jordan. When the Philistines took the Ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Now, in their mind, Dagon is the greatest of all gods. 
one of the things that this reminds me of, and one of the things that I have wanted to say, and I have told people through the years, and and I was reading an article just this week that I thought really uh, told the truth with regards to it, and that is is that in the world people have different beliefs. I mean, and I'm not talking about say United States versus say Brazil, where where Adriano is, or or Africa, or Scotland, or or um, any other place like that. But I'm talking about even within our own community, even within our own street, even within our own neighborhood, even within the folks that live around us. We have varying beliefs. And we need to remember that those varying beliefs, those are theirs. I'm not saying they're correct. I'm not saying that we should listen to what they say from the standpoint of giving heed to it. Listen, yes, in conversation. But we need to be very careful that we don't just sit down and condemn an individual's beliefs. Just, no, you're wrong. Destroy a relationship and, and, and destroy the, the interaction, and you'll never get them. You'll never touch them with the Word of God. And so we have to be very careful. And this is this as I read this, I think about that and understand that the Philistines had this belief. It wasn't correct. It wasn't what it should have been. And yet it was theirs. And so when we read it, we have to understand it was theirs. They believed in Dagon. Not right, but they still believed in it. And so they brought the Ark of God. They sent it by Dagon because they thought Dagon would, in essence, take care of it. He's superior. And when the people of Ashdod rose early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set it in its place again. Now, one might reason within themselves, well, something happened in the middle of the night. Somebody came in and pushed Dagon over. Someone took him in and 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 pushed him off, or or maybe maybe an earthquake. God is showing His power here because first thing Dagon falls, he falls to, on his face the earth, and they took him, they set him in his place again, and when they arose early the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. Now. Think about it. Happened once? Yeah, sure. Okay. Something a little fishy. Happened twice. God is showing his power. God is showing his might. God is showing his strength. They're beginning probably now to see this. Uh Uh-oh. We've got a problem. No, it didn't wipe them out. No, 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 it didn't. The head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were broken off on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left of it. Therefore, neither the priest of Dagon nor any who came or who come into Dagon's house tread on the household or th- excuse me on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. So they're beginning to see. Yeah, now like Steve says, they don't. It doesn't change their belief, but they're beginning to see we've got a problem. We, we've we've got to settle this. We've got a problem. And they're beginning to see, surely, the hand of God. Think about, it's kind of interesting when it says, uh, he's fallen on his face to the ground, the head of Dagon and both palms were broken off. The head, some, it was in Willis's commentary, but he quoted someone, and I forgot now who he said, but this individual said, the head, that which thinks, the two palms, that which works. Dagon cannot think or work anymore. Kind of an interesting thought. It, but it, it's broken. Now, you might say, okay, to happen twice, that's really something. That's special. Wouldn't happen. It might happen just once, but not twice. One of the things that is sad, I think, to me, is to read religious books and religious individuals that will look at this, this story, and go then especially into the New Testament and look at the miracles of Jesus and dispel them. They're just happenstances. 
nothing about God, no power of God. These are just things that happen. Well, this shows, without at least in my thinking, this shows God's power. This shows his might. But the hand of the Lord, this is verse 6, was heavy on the people of Ashdod, and he ravaged them and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. As God, Yahweh, God, humiliates Dagon, there's something terrible that happens. And what happens is, is that the folks are ravaged with tumors. Now, this is one of those where theologians try to explain themselves and explain what it is, and they they have a difficult time. One of the things that we'll see more so, I think, in the sixth chapter than in this chapter is, is that these tumors were uh, actual tumors that came up on the body. Now, theologians, some theologians have said the the tumors here it was not really tumors as we think of them, but it was really syphilis. The problem that these folks were having was really syphilis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially we'll see that, like I say, as we finish this chapter and get into the sixth the, the sixth chapter. I thought an interesting one through the years that I've seen that said uh, the, these uh, tumors, as it's called, so one theologian said, wasn't anything but hemorrhoids. Well, be bad, be bad enough. <laughs> yeah, if you've had them, it'd be, if you've had them, it's bad enough, let me tell you. They're not fun. But um, one of the things that we're going to find out is that people die from this. And so when we look at this at the very beginning, then it says that he ravaged them and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. We're wondering what the tumors are. Well, let's go on for just a little bit, and I'll, I'll give you what I think it, it is in just a second. And when the men of Ashdod saw how it was, and think about it, they saw, kind of defeat syphilis and hemorrhoids, you know, and it's got to be something else. But when they saw how it was, they said, the ark of God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand, God's hand, he's talking about his strength, is harsh toward us, and Dagon our God. Therefore, they sent and gathered to themselves all the lords of the Philistines and said, what shall we do with the ark of God of Israel? Now, they sent, they gathered themselves, all the lords of the Philistines. We don't really know what this is. Some have said, and it's it's probably the best explanation, or it's the best one that I know of, is that there were five major cities within Philistia, and those were pretty much city-states, and they had rulers. Each one individually had a ruler. And so, of course, then you had kings above that, but or a king. But you had these rulers. And that might have been what these lords were. In other words, what we might call high-ranking officials. That fits well. To say that it's exactly that, I can't. But nevertheless, they call them together. What are we going to do with the ark? Dagon has, has been shown to be of no effect. We've got these tumors. What in the world? We've, we've got to do something with the ark. And they answered, here's the last part of verse 8. They answered, let the ark of God of Israel be carried away to Gath. So they carried the ark of God of Israel away. Now, Gath's still in Philistia. Gath is still within the Philistine territory. It's kind of interesting. Let's push it off, but let's don't get rid of it. Let, let, let's push it to the side, but let's don't get rid of it. You ever you ever had anything at your house like that? I don't really have a use for it, but I'm going to put it over here. We all we all have. Yeah, no couch, something. You know, you, you just push it off to the side. It's still there. You hadn't gotten completely rid of it. And that's seemingly what happens here. And so it was, verse 9, that after they carried it away, that the hand of the Lord was against the city with very great destruction, and he struck the men of the city, both small and great, and tumors 
broke out on them. Now, notice what it says. Tumors broke out on them. So much so, and it's interesting that it says great, or both small and great, and tumors. Now, your Bible may have a footnote that says the Vulgate and also the Septuagint has that they had tumors in their secret parts. But notice what it says. It says that it broke out on them. Now, when we get, especially into the next chapter, I think one of the more plausible explanations is that this was probably not syphilis. It was not hemorrhoids. It was probably the bubonic plague because... One of the things that they're going to do is go over to the sixth chapter. Let's just look at the sixth chapter right quick. Look at verse four. Uh huh. They answered, or it says, What is the trespass offering which we shall return to him? They answered, Five golden tumors and five golden rats, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. For the same plague was on all of you and on your lords. Same plague. Now, bubonic plague, of course. I think we understand it now. Maybe we didn't years ago, but comes off the flea of a rat, bites an individual, and creates uh, this illness. One of those offsets or one of the, the uh, I don't, not really symptoms, but just one of the effects of having been bitten, if you will, and having bubonic uh, plague is, is tumors. And so that fits. And that's seemingly, at least for me, what what I think it might have been. I will say this. Even if it wasn't, it's terrible. It's awful. You didn't want it. They didn't want it. it like I say, we'll find out it kill people. And so all of this is showing the hand of God, the power of God, the might of God. Therefore... Verse 10, they sent the ark of God to Ekron. It's kind of interesting. They keep passing this ark around, but they don't want to get rid of it. But they sent it to, to Ekron. So it was, as the ark of God came to Ekron, that the Ekronites cried out, say, they brought the ark of God to Israel to us to kill us and our people. <laughs> Whoa, we don't want it either. Nobody wants it. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines, once again, the hierarchy, if you will, and said, send away the ark of God of Israel. Let it go back to its own place so that it does not kill us and our people. It would seem as if, and there are discussions over what, what uh, exactly they mean by send it to its place, but maybe they were talking about sending it back to Israel. Some think that that's what they were saying, and some thought that they were talking about send it back to Shiloh. However, there's a problem. The best we can tell from a history standpoint, when the Philistines won in chapter 4, that if not in that battle, that very soon after they destroyed Shiloh, which was where the ark was. And so there would be difficulty in carrying it back to that exact place. And so if if that is true, then this idea of carrying it back is the idea, let's just give it back to Israel. Let's let them have it again. One of those two is probably correct. Which one? I you know, I'll let you take a guess, a pick. It it seems as if from what we can gather from a historical standpoint, especially that Shiloh was destroyed. And there's also a statement in um, Jeremiah that would lend to that idea that Shiloh was destroyed and they couldn't have carried it back to Shiloh, but they could carry it back, of course, to Israel. And so they want, and it's interesting, and it goes back to even what Steve said a while ago, even though they saw all this, they didn't correct their way. They didn't leave their religion of worshiping all of these gods, Dagon being the chief god, but they recognized the power of God. And it's interesting that send away the ark of God, of God of Israel. Now, they didn't just call him God, but they called him God of Israel. Let it go back to its own place. Let it does not kill us and our people. For there's a deadly destruction throughout all the city. 
The hand of God was very heavy there, and the men who did not die were stricken with tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. All right. Anything you want to ask? Anything you want to say? All good, I'm sure. Not a lot. It's history. Yeah. Yeah, it's bizarre history. It's, you know, that's why I said uh, you were, I think you were talking business, but but uh, that's why I say I always find a little humor in this, especially with Dagon falling on his face. What are a couple of, of things we might gather from it? Well, first of all, God's in control. God wasn't where he was supposed to be by virtue of of the his presence with the ark. Now, I'm not talking about God's everywhere. I understand that. But at that time, the thought was, this is where God is. And so even when he was not where he should have been, back really, if you will, in Shiloh, he was still in control. And sometimes, even in our lives, we try to displace God with something else or someone else or whatever. And even though we can do that, the reality of it is God's still in control. God's still there. He's sovereign. He's overall. And then secondly, a second lesson is, is that nothing can really stand against God. Evil looks great. Evil looks like it's in power. Evil looks like it will win. But read book of Revelation. It doesn't win. It does not win. Victory is found in Jesus, and therefore uh, we we may look like at times we've been beaten up and, and drugged through the, the ringer, but the reality of it is, is God's still in control. And we know that God's in control. And I think that's one of the great things you can look at in the fifth chapter and you say, okay, it looks it looks bleak, it looks bad. But God was still in control, showing his power. Anything else? <laughs> well, it's history. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah, they never, it was. It was almost as if they wanted to move it, but they they didn't want to get rid of it. They wanted to move it to the place that it would least affect the least amount of folks. They these were smaller. They were still large, but they were still smaller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really does. Well, wouldn't you be? <laughs> Yeah, you would have. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Of course, like you say, you, yes, could be. But remember, the people were realizing it because they said, "Get it out of here, so that we don't die." So they understood the power that it had or represented. Right. Yeah. That, right. Right. Mm-mm. But they wanted to get rid of it. Uh, represent represented. Yeah, I've read that. Yeah, the um, the image. Hmm. The official answer, Wikipedia. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> well, you, you're not going to find another Philistine, sorry. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, you're right. You are right. Nope, it's gone.
Mm-hmm. No. Um, yes. It, uh, once again, Willis, I'm quoting Willis because it's the one I'm reading mo- mostly. Willis makes a discussion there. By the way, it's John T. Willis. Uh, he's a member of the church. This is the sweet commentary series of the Old Testament. Although, when I say he's a member of the church, he's to the left of me. <laughs> but uh, he made the statement that he thought that that was an inappropriate translation because the word that's used there is not, it, it's a translator error, I guess would be the best way of saying it. Yes. Well, it's one of those things that ultimately it, it is from the standpoint of that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's the Hebrew word Elohim, which is always translated God, our God. But it has led to. Do I? I think that every translation out there has problems. Every one of them has problems. And so there's not one out there. Matter of fact, um, I loved and appreciated Brother Hugo McCord. You've heard me talk about Brother Hugo McCord several times. He made his own translation of the New Testament. It was kind of interesting that after it came out, he had to send out a, a little card that went in his New Testament where of errors he thought he made and changes he would have, if he could have gone back and had it reprinted, he would have made. There's not a there's not a, a translation that's that doesn't have errors. Um, one of the great great stories in the history of Fried Hardeman was that there was a fella that he is retired now. He uh, was in the Bible department, but he's like I say he's retired now. His wife's not in the best of health. But Doc Woods, Doc Woods came into Fried Hardeman. Long before I got there, I'm trying to think now. Somewhere in the 70s, if I'm not mistaken, early 70s. Anyway, Doc was trained in Old Testament. And from a standpoint of one of the better versions of the Old Testament is the RSV, the Revised Standard Version. And that's what Doc was using. And some of the brethren that had supported Fried Hardeman, loved Fried Hardeman, thought that Doc was very liberal in using the RSV. Um, the room, it is now gone, or it's been taken up, remodeled twice, but I was went to it not long ago just to see it. It's not a classroom anymore, sadly. And uh, anyway, Brother William Woodson brought a lot of these folks that were trying to tear Free Hardman down by saying Free Hardman's gone liberal, they're using terrible versions of the Bible, so forth and so on. Brother William Woodson, head of the department at the time, Brought a lot of these preachers in and brought Doc in. Anyway, they said, let's list versions of the Bible. And so in this classroom, there was literally, it was a big classroom. There was a chalkboard the whole length of the classroom, and there was a chalkboard except for the door, the width of the classroom. And so they began to to mention or to list some of the versions of the Bible. And Woodson wrote all these on the chalkboard. And so Woodson then carried, and he said, he said, he's just started at the beginning. He says, does this one have tro- have problems? This one have issues? Yes. So they put a check mark by it. Does this one have issues? Yes. So they put a check mark by it. And he said, there's not a version here that doesn't have some some error in it. And he says, so which one are we going to use? It gets down. Translations get down to 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 a matter of opinion. And what's best, I can tell you now, my preferred, because they're they're more of the conservative branch and their translations. There are translations, translations vary. There, there's the modified liberal, uh, literal, liberal, modified literal translation. Then there are, are paraphrases, but then there are, are tr- translations that are Translated, yes, but also sort of paraphrased as well. I like the ones that are more literal. Well, what are some of them? RSV is one for the Old Testament. The uh, 
King James Version. I like it, the New King James Version, the American Standard. If you were really to put the two best, you would probably put the Revised Standard in the Old Testament and the American Standard, which you can't buy too many good quality copies of the American Standard, but in, of the New Testament. New American Standard's good. The ESV is the, the newest version that is conservative, and it is very good. It is very good. Ken, ESV, English Standard, English Standard Version. Ken has the study Bible of it. They make a, small, a whole lot smaller Bible. Um, all the Baptist people that have used to have headquarters downtown. Crossways, cross, lightway. Thank you. <laughs> the, that they uh, they own the rights to to the English Standard Version, but that's just know that they're all versions have problems. They're all man-made. And then you have discoveries, archaeological discoveries that things change, words change, and so. Um, there's a there's a vast difference if you go back and read the King James and the New King James, which is what I'm using, of course, in the fifth chapter here. There's a lot of difference in the two. And so I think the best thing to do is find somebody that knows, talk to them, but to do a comparative study. And it's a it's real easy if you have a computer, it's real easy to do a comparative study. Uh, you can get on on uh, different different websites I can give you two or three but you can literally set up like say first Samuel 5 and here's one version and here's another version here's another version here's another version and you can read them parallel a uh, harmony okay or did you have a parallel Bible parallel. Rodney Clef <laughs> There are harmonies of, yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's done that way. Most of them uh, interfuse. There's an interesting book that's old. I don't even know if you, I guess you can probably get it on Amazon. Uh, it's called The Harmony of the Gospel, which it, it literally, it's a commentary too, but it goes through and it just synthesizes all. Uh, F. Lagarde Smith did some work in that. and. Uh, the chronological Bible. And so um, that's that. Anything else? Yeah, I, I like I say I find I would find a, I would find a more literal. The the American Standard Version is probably the most literal translation out there. But in being literal, because Hebrew and Greek doesn't read like English. It's very hard. They don't flow. It doesn't flow easily. And so consequently, people didn't buy it. And sentence structure is tough. Yeah. Yeah. But it's good. It's good. So anyway. All right. Well, let's bow for word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this day, thankful for the blessing of it, for the opportunity to study your word and for the history that we've studied tonight. And we realize we're in the midst of history, but we learn so much. We learn so much of your love and your care and your concern for the children of Israel and ultimately for us. But we also, as tonight, we learned of your power and your greatness and your might that no one or nothing else can stand up to you or against you and be able to stand. We ask that you be with us now, that you watch over us, bless us, help us to have a, a good week and help be with us as we go throughout the rest of this week. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Y'all have a great week. Thank you.